I'm Gene Govan. I'm one of the old timers. Wayne, you said 42, I'm 46. Oh, okay, sonny, I'll listen. Okay. <laughs> Wayne has been one of my mentors for years. And I tap Wayne as a mentor for youth. But I was 25 years as a 4-H leader. And also credit Jeff Prince back there as one of my mentors from probably 1980. We're both sort of retired. I live north of Turtle Lake in Prairie Pothole Country, right beside Crooked Lake. This, it's titled uh, 39 Years of Cross Fencing. But I'll jump back previous into the I started farming in 1967 and middle to later 70s I started questioning more and more why can't I get the livestock back to the back side of that pasture when you have two miles of shoreline. They're always close to the shore, they won't go back just tall and thick, but they won't go back there, it's always back to the tender sh short stuff within a quarter mile of the shoreline. It took me several years, then I realized I was at a buffet at a salad bar and my wife was picking, selecting salad. Then I realized that's what the cattle are doing. That's why I can't get them back there. Even though I, I was told in the past, put salt, mineral placement back, get them away from the water hole, that didn't help. Cattle are selective. Why, do, why would I want to pick coarse, woody salad there's some tender stuff with it when I can go to the closer to the shoreline or to the water tank and there's some tender stuff with no wolfy plants. Ah. Simple cross fencing as a tool. To, but that was that was a revelation for me and that's I'm going to touch on lots of little things today. I'm not going to give any PowerPoint or anything. Most of this has already been covered. It's, to me, it's just thousands of little things. Uh, 1980, then I started cross fencing, went into four pasture twice over. It worked, but I thought it could be better. And then I, 1983, that magic word cell grazing, it was eight paddocks, it was to be eight pastures, and three times over. Well, it sounded like a bullet, magic one, but it said 32 days rotation. That was the guidelines at the time. And I started figuring it out. It was actually only 20 day, 28 days rest recovery. This, I'm all on native prairie. I'm not on introduced, reintroduced tame grass pastures, which can be a little bit different for monitoring regrowth response. But I kept up with that three, three times around, it would have collapsed. Not enough recovery time. But I realized that and saw that coming. Then it started slowing down the moves, so it'd be in longer. So I started to stretch the rest factor out to about 50, 60 days, and it looked a lot better. But I kept that up and hadn't done any further, I probably would have a, I'm guessing about 20% increase in stocking rate capability. And then in fall of 1986, uh, Steve and Chuck Fettig, Jeff Prince, and Ken Miller, Ken and Bonnie Miller, we were all were sitting in on a five and a half day course, holistic resource management conducted by Ellen Savory and went home mentally exhausted and but have never looked back. The very next spring, I sold my creep feeder and started putting in more cross fencing and planning the moves, where they are, when and for how long to meet a certain objective. That was by 1990, instead of eight, I had, I think it was 18, had 24 paddocks, more cross fencing, no additional acres, more cross fencing, and I was able to double my stocking rate. 
instead of 20%, I was able to double it to 200%. And then along, and then I did, I was doing a lot of winter, cold day, boring uh, charting. One of them I charted out. All of a sudden I realized, penciling out expenses, all of a sudden my annual cow calf mineral, salt and mineral supplement costs dropped from about $20 per cow calf pair for the year down to 80 cents per pair for the year. The land was starting to heal. Then along in those years, I also did six years of flagging and marking on the flag uh, and monitoring regrowth response after they're clipped uh, or grazed, not even clip some, or just rip them, see how fast they re regrow. And that was interesting. Then I started questioning more and more, what is the minimum adequate rest recovery? If any of you haven't figured out, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> but I extended our rest, re growing day, rest recovery days up to 110 days. And I figured I can speed up a rotation if things are looking good and things are growing faster. But if I'm caught and I have to move them because there's nothing left, but I have to move them to the next one, then I'll be caught in accelerated grazing. And that's a dangerous position. I'd rather be error on the cautious side. Wayne is nodding yes. We've, we've sort of figured that out, sort of. <laughs> But I encourage everybody, after I can observe a plant being grazed, after they take a bite, flag it, mark, measure it. See, sometimes coyotes like to play with those darn flags and strip them off, but it's really interesting, 10, five, three, five day, 20 days, 50 days, maybe 70 days in extreme drought, you only have that much, or you might have six inches in big blue stem in five days. And then I started questioning, we need longer rest recovery because it isn't just grasses. We have a lot of forbs out there. And forb species to grass species, what is it, Jody? About at least five to one forbs to grasses species-wise for good healthy prairie. And a lot of them are very palatable. Not only that, some of them have a way deeper rooting or bringing up nutrients back up, shedding them at the surface or by the surface. Old dynamic community. Another thing I've learned, we very seldom go more than once around each year anymore. Maybe 1.2 times on a good year when things are really growing good. It sounds backwards, but the slower it grows, the slower I move. The faster it grows, the faster I move. I might move in two days, growing slow, it might be 10 days. I don't have any set by the calendar. This year, we didn't even go once around, but I'm set up real good for next year. My charting shows them charting and livestock performance, pounds of beef per acre also. <coughs> I don't go by numbers ahead also, I go by pounds of beef per acre. Everybody knows bushels per acre, but how many figure out pounds of beef produced per acre? That's what, I, that's what I was selling. And another one that puzzled me for a long time, the take half, leave half, old rancher rule of thumb. I asked one time, and several times, what half do I take? Well, you weigh it, or you just take the top half and leave the bottom half. And it took me several years to realize that has nothing to do with it. It's the amount of leaf that is left. That's the solar panel for the plant. Don't take more than half, then it still has pretty much 100% ability to keep on growing and to regrow. But take 58% of the plant, it's pretty much done, has to start from the sacrificing roots, borrowing from the piggy bank. Another one I've 
the old rancher rule of thumb, and I've heard this from Wayne Berry, from your uncle, I believe you said, and also from some old ranchers down in the Sand Hills in Nebraska. Be very careful of and aware of grazing fall green up after summer brown because you can potentially reduce next year's production by up to 50%. I've, I've had ARS and Mandan try to do searches if there's any research on that. There is no known research on that, just old rancher wisdom. The plant is greening up in the fall, it's sucking up energy from its roots, it needs time to put it back, putting back into the piggy bank what it borrowed to regrow. But they have to be somewhere every year. That's where planned grazing, planned where, planned where they are and for how long. Another thing I do is, wherever, for example, wherever they are, I put the herd in at say June 1st this year, Calendar-wise, I have a plan, I won't use it again June 1st, period, for another 10 years, even though most everything gets used every year. Change the time of year every year. Managing for diversity. All the different species out there have different maturity dates. Uh, along into the middle 1980s, after five, six years of cross fencing, even though it's sort of the 80s were sort of dry and real dry in 88, 89, and into the middle summer 1990. I have, I'm in the prairie pothole country. I guess I'm small acreage now, about 1,500 acres. About half of it is in cropland, the other half is native prairie. It appeared like my prairie potholes were not getting as full as they used to, but they seemed like they were holding holding water longer. And evening of July 3rd, 1990, after two and a half years of drought, less than seven inches of rain and moisture in two and a half years, we had a four inch rainfall in one evening. And uh, July 5th, I called Dr. Jimmy Richardson at NDSU, a soil scientist, some of you know his, not his notoriety. <laughs> And I asked, where's my water? I'm still hauling water. I don't have any water in my prairie potholes. Dugouts are still dry. But my neighboring, neighboring land has flooded and washed out fences and washed out gullies in the fields. The next morning at 10 o'clock, he was knocking at my door. He says, I think you just achieved your mission of capturing your raindrops where they fall. And what we, what we found is, uh, and then the next year was 1990, along with Steve and Chuck Fettig, was at NDSU, was at ARS, and NRCS, then it was SDS, came out and started doing this. But there were Zuzu meters, uh, water and filtration data, and we found we had, along with Fedix and us, we were comparing notes. Those, uh, we had we improved the infiltration. Mine was an average previous under heavy years and years of heavy season long grazing was 0.5 to maybe 0.8 inches per hour infiltration rate capability of few sites, maybe 1.2. But we had increased it up to 6.2 inches per hour infiltration. Uh, we were raising more grass. Capturing the raindrops when they fall, we identified Four flows of water in the landscape, to keep it simple. Surface flow, what we see running on the surface. Infiltration, and then through flow, through downhill through the soil profile, and then reflow. And that reflow is slowly adjusted from the top bottom of the hill to where it encompasses almost the whole landscape, but that's a more detailed description. It take longer than I have today. But that is infiltration through flow, through the soil profile downhill, and then reflow. That's the process that gives sustained flows to quick streams and rivers, and versus surface flow, flood and dry. I can give an example of that. In June, there was an area, a few, 
Uh, I won't give any directions. I don't like to do boundary line comparisons. One person said they had seven inches of rain overnight, but it didn't do much of any good because it only soaked in two and a half inches. And another one said, yeah, we had an inch of rain through our area, through my draw, through my creek. It was dry the night before. The next morning, I couldn't cross it with my four-wheeler from one inch of rain. It was all shutting off on the surface. Those rains did not raise any grass. But it has to soak in better than, better than six to ten inches to be effective. Otherwise, it's just, again, evaporation, transpiration. My method of simple monitoring, I just stick a flag wire in and feel the, cool, feel the coolness on the wire for how the depth of infiltration after a rainfall. Very simple, but if it's complicated for monitoring, I don't do it. So. <laughs> then there's carbon, carbon sequestration is a big buzzword politically and all over. I've been, some of my carbon testing goes back to 1990, or 28 years of data, 29 years of data. But I'll give, I'll give one example that's all been slowly increasing, slow, but not big sharp ones. And this is all in Native Prairie. And I don't know if I want big, huge carbon numbers on top of Native Prairie. I think it would probably just be Kentucky bluegrass and other, and, but I have one carbon test, it's 2012, it's zero to 10 centimeters. In 2012, 4.29%. 4 2015 was 4.55. That's some others in the room, 5.5253, but this, this is just this one example. And then 10 to 25 centimeters depth, in 2012 at 3.21 carbon but in the 10 to 25 it crashed and went down to 197 and the 25 to 40 centimeter depth 2012 at 2.82 and that one crashed to 1.33 uh, 2012, 2010, 2011 overwinter, and starting 2012, it started getting wetter years. 2014 was heavy saturation. To, during that winter, we had a snow cover, very little ground profile freezing, and that, that summer in the 2015, the, the further depths, the disturbed it, it turned into instant soup, like like quick clay and it, it was Mark Liebig found a paper on it. it took about 18 months to figure out what did I do wrong here it was just mother nature at work heavy saturation have natural indigenous sulfur within the soil released because it was so wet saturated released the carbon from the soil and soil through flow down through the downhill was taking the carbon with it so it was Nothing I did, it was just a, just a natural phenomenon. So the Mother Nature is always throwing quirks and the further I go, the more questions there are. There are. Running depth and enhancement. We used to have about an average, and went into prior to cross fencing days, three to five inches average grass rooting depth. And that, incidentally, 20 year rested CRP, 20, 30, 40 rested any grassland, and or heavy season long graze, that's all they have, average grass rooting depth. If you get those rains, that's all it soaks in. A few days later, it's a drought again. We've enhanced our average grass rooting depth from 4 to 10 X. We have a 40, 50, 60 and beyond grass rooting depths now. I'm not talking the forbs, I'm just talking the grasses.
uh, financial benefits. We're running about an average of a 300% increase. We tripled our stocking rates, but it didn't happen overnight. But less can be more. We have about a 420 to 450% increase in 4-H production on our native prairie. A good harvest, we could harvest more of it, but we'd like to leave more behind than we used to raise previous total. My mission is to feed the soil first, that animal second. Because the soil is where the income comes from. Animals, the livestock are just a tool to harvest it. And, and also to bring it back to health, use the very same tool, like Wayne was saying, that degraded, use the very same tool in a different form to enhance. And I'm sort of retired, but the neighbors keep me busy, just like Wayne and Jeff. <laughs> but in fact, I had two calls today. I have a little old no-tail drill 15 feet. I rebuilt it this year, put everything new under it. And I still have some more seeding to do this fall with the dormant season grass seeding. And I believe, last I heard, I believe DU is going to help my cousin with that. So. And water line development. Yeah, we have water line. We have a pretty, I try to build in redundancy of lake shore or prairie potholes, dugouts. And pretty much most of my paddocks now have a water tank in the, for every paddock. I like to have redundancy. If one or the other fails, like this year, I think I have 112 prairie potholes, only two of them are holding any water this year. But other years they were overflowing. I actually have more, more acres for grazing when they're dry. So. Just thousands of little things. I'll mention about uh, bale grazing and swath grazing has been touched on a little today also. I started swath grazing around the middle 1980s. The very first fall I did it, late fall, it was slough grass around edges of sloughs where I do crop aftermath grazing. A neighbor called me and was all excited. My cows are out into that hay that I didn't get bailed up. <laughs> She meant well, and I thanked her and I explained what my purpose was. And But this was a long time ago, and uh, bale grazing, I started doing bale grazing in the probably the early 1990s. And believe me, both swath grazing and bale grazing are a very valuable tool. As already explained today, as some of you did, probably didn't catch it, put them, put them out at least a minimum of enough for a minimum of three days that way the boss cows can't get it all also the timid ones have some to graze on if you just feed every day or every other day the boss cows are getting it all the timid are getting not much but three days to five days then the timid are also getting something they all clean up they all get candy and then move them or just sometimes i'll set them out they might be a mile apart and just let them go because I'm just addressing those little clay knobs. Cropland, I've also done it on native prairie, but I've used cattail hay, slough hay, and I know there's no danger of taking it seed from cattails onto the hilltop on the native prairie. And it's, it is not bale waste, it's bale litter feeding the soil. That was a paradigm shift for me. Uh, University of Manitoba up at Brandon research data on bale grazing using a bale feeder in the corral or wherever it's about 12% waste on the bale whatever type of hay it is it's about 12% waste I'm not looking at the litter they were monitoring the nutrition value of the bale okay and then uh, bale grazing out in the open it was instead of 12 percent it was 12 and a half percent only a half percent more loss nutrient wise per bale 
And then there's no manure to haul out. That's one, one benefit, plus the benefit of the dung and urinating out in the open. Uh, here's some other data from University of Manitoba. The average 1,100 to 1,200 pound stock cow urinates out about 112 to 117 pounds of plant usable N per year. Just in the urine, not counting the dung. And if they're urina urinating out on the land this time of year or into the winter grazing like gardeners are doing, over 90% of that nitrates in that urine are available the next year for plant growth. So less than 10% are volatilizing. But in the feedlot situation of well composted manure, at best only 8% of those nitrates are getting back out in the land when you haul manure out. You're losing over 80% by feedlot feeding versus out in the open. That's not counting the dung, that's just the urine. But I'm just giving little things in this. Thousands of little things is, all, is what it's all about. That was my time. I don't, have, I don't own a watch. I just have a flip phone, 3.30. Every half hour's already up. I, I grew up with cover cropping and companion cropping. It's nothing new. My grandfather was paid in the 30s, 1930s, to include yellow blossom sleep clover in with his grain crops. It's nothing new. Companion cropping. I have played with and done companion cropping with sunflowers, putting 10, 12 pounds of lentils in the fertilizer box when I'm seeding sunflowers and I'm getting doing my ability to pull nitrogen out of the air versus pulling it from a chemical fertilizer dealer. Equivalent about the same yields but bioculture versus monoculture with companion cropping charting out the, my charting was about 20 to 30 percent better per acre bottom line. Less expenses and then the extra benefit of the next second year, third year. Same parallel benefits as uh, Tim Fowler doing cattle and sheep together in the 80s and early 90s at Hedinger Research, bioculture versus monoculture. Same percent of benefit. Cover cropping, it used to be called green fallow. They used to do that quite a bit until the government started demanding bare black fallow and started getting penalized. So I had to quit that, sort of. But then we, then now it's cover cropping. The only thing then, back then, was we didn't do the diversity that's now. Cover cropping, I see a lot of it. And also, not just for myself, but for my neighbors. And I have some samples here and also of cover cropping, I just pulled them. And I also did this, a kitchen rag test. That was 38 days on that rag. It's a rag now, but it was a nice clean towel when I put it in, 30. For the life of me, I don't know why anybody s says there is no benefit to cover crops. I guess I've been doing it all my life and it's just uh, grew up with it. Cover crops, companion cropping. For every additional day I gain of having something green growing out in the land, I'm harvesting that much more sunlight. And that's a goal of mine, harvest sunlight. Also, now I'm getting into some other fields. It's been 25 years. I just sold the last of my cow herd in February. I've been doing custom grazing for 22 years. And I'm already booked for next year. 
We have not used any Ivomec or any systemics or any, even, even any insecticide ear tags for probably over 25 years. One of my methods for insect control is I don't move just to the next pasture. I do one, two, three, four, and then when anticipate planting, you know there's going to be a fly buildup, parasite buildup, then we skip paddocks. So I have a minimum a quarter mile between from where they were to where they're going. Leave the fly eggs, insect eggs, and larvae behind. And the adult fly has a short life. And I leave the insects behind because I feel they're a very valuable part of uh, mineral and nutrient cycling. If I have a dung pile that lasts more than three days, I'm doing something wrong. Unless it's this time of year when things are really slow and Right, Wayne? It's more than three days, even two days, there's something wrong. Just thousands of little things. Wildlife benefit, probably about benefit to the increase in benefit to stocking rate. It's all related to soil health. And 300% increase in stocking rate, disregarding the 400 plus increase in forage productivity, that's the benefit to wildlife. I hope Dane is agreeing with me back there at DU. Canada thistle, I'll make it short. I've been spot spraying Canada thistle for years and years. It seemed like it was not making any headway. And three years ago, I started thinking, ah, I have to do something different. I quit spraying contacted the county weed control officer, got a hold of some Canada thistle gall flies, and they started getting those galls on the stems, and wherever their gall was, there's no viable seed head. Two years ago, I got a hold of some through the county weed officer, some uh, Canada thistles stem weevils, and released them also. No chemicals, no clipping. Uh, found even if I clip the plant, there goes the host plant hosting that insect for overwintering. Just leave them stand, ignore them. It was tough to do. But some of the places that had heavy Canada thistle three years ago and two years ago, with the com combination of the stem weevil and the, and the gall fly, was about 95% elimination in the Canada thistle stand. I'm going to try it again next year if it's just a fluke but chemicals haven't been working. So there's just some more little things they're gonna throw out. And there's some more monitoring. I do the water infiltration enhancement. I just use a six inch length from an old six inch drain auger. I tap it in three inches into the soil, pour an inch of water in it, and time it how long it takes for that inch of water to soak in. It's really easy to do, and I don't do it all the time, but it's just periodic monitoring. And sometimes it's gone. On those half inch to 0.8 inch per hour sites, it's pretty darn boring sitting there for an hour or two hours watching, for, waiting for the last drop to go. But, but when you start getting eight, six, eight, 10 inches per hour, uh, six inches, what would that be? 10 minutes. Uh, get up to 10 inches per hour, that's, you're talking seconds it goes down. And that's the enhancement, capturing it in the soil, getting it in deeper than six to 10 inches. And then I also brought some, I did a quick one jump test with my shovel. It's another monitoring tool. I do a one jump test, just one jump, how far does it go in in one jump? Mark thought that was neat, Susan. <laughs> but here's, here's, this is, each of these trays have two, this is from a native prairie, this is a 12 inch depth, this is one, one jump, this is one jump, 10 inch, or 12 inch depth. This is, uh, from more average, this is from a, one of those thin clay, or, Hill knobs that probably at the most in the past would raise 
maybe 500 pounds an acre production. Well, it's well over that now. And, and this is, this tray is from uh, my cropland. The one side is from, I tried to do an average, not the best or worst. And this is where cover crop was seeded this fall also. This is a one jump, but I had trouble getting it the 12 inches because it's so loose and crumbly on all of them at the deeper depths. And this one, this one in the cropland came from one of my, a quarter I have, it's outside the fence. Cattle have never been in any crop aftermath grazing. This one has. It's the only difference management between the two. This I put in, it was about, it was less than three feet away from this one here. This is 38 days and even started disintegrating the plastic. You can take that for Mark if you want, it's his towel, Susan. <laughs> but I'm about over my time and, and I guess I'm open for questions. Just, I didn't present anything major, just hundreds of little things. I didn't deliberately, didn't do a PowerPoint. Well, my computer sort of crashed and I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> but I figured I'd just give a little talk. It took me over two days to sort of put together and recrunch and recrunch what I just presented now here. So. Questions? That, that rule of thumb you talked about, uh, don't graze fall green up after summer brown. Can you graze that after after the freeze? Uh, the question is, the, the rancher rule of thumb, can you graze it, the fall green up after summer brown after it freezes? I would say reluctantly, because I always have a backup plan and contingency, I, I call it redundancy, where do I go next in case something happens? And next and next and next. And because then uh, that's why I also built in, if I graze it this fall in October, I'm not gonna graze it in October again for another 10 years. You know, time and timing, does that help? Sort of answer, is that what you do Wayne? Yeah, FedEx I think, yeah, they do that also. Yeah, yeah it's an old rancher rule of thumb and some of that old wisdom that's sort of forgotten about. So. Anything else? Wayne? Wait, 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 wait. The Old Guy Society. Yeah. I talked to you about... You're going to do what we've done for years? Yeah, these are two guys like, like two, yeah. we're two old steers now, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that, it's actually really leaning on each Not other. It's actually leaning, but <laughs> each other. So we that was, that's, that's the only reason we came here. It's, it's nice to see you all, but we just haven't done this for a long time. And, uh, thanks. Jet, sort of, sort of thanks for twisting my arm. And I probably wouldn't have came here if Wayne wouldn't have came. So, honestly. <laughs> I wanted the opportunity to rub shoulders again. <laughs> It's been a fun journey, and I, I could never go back to season-long grazing, could never go back to grain farming without cover crops. Neighbors keep me extremely busy, busier than I want, and seeding, uh, seeding in the spring, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, probably into November, at least nine months of the year, my little old no-till drill is being used. And most of it, 90% of it's for neighbors, and I'm supposedly retired. So. <laughs> okay, anything, anything more? And please come up and look at the soil profiles here. With that, I'll shut the mic off.